Morbidly beautiful radio for radio. We for radio. We for radio. We for radio. Episode of the Calling Hours Horror Podcast on Morbidly Beautiful Radio. Once again, it is I, your head undertaker, the dead man Michael Jones of MorbidlyBeautiful.com, Coughing Cuties Magazine, and Digital Dead Magazine. I hope everyone had an outstanding Christmas, and as we get ready to head into the new year, we have a great episode planned for you this evening. On this episode, we'll be talking with director and producer Sean Burkett. Now, for those of you that used to listen to the podcast when I was on Horror Society Radio, I've had Sean on the show before on two separate occasions. You should know Sean from other films such as The Sleeping Soul, A Shameless Revenge, uh, Midsummer Nightmare, uh, Bludgeon, The Lamb, And, of course, his current film that everyone is talking about, both positively and negatively, depending on how you want to look at it, is Don't Fuck in the Woods. And, most recently, he has announced, in fact, that there will be a sequel to that film. And, as a matter of fact, because of that, I'm going to have on a couple of people who are going to be involved in that project with him. Included in that is actress Brandy Mason. Now, 
Brandy's done a little bit of everything in the industry as well. You know, she's done acting. She's worked in the makeup department. She's done productions. She's done special effects. As far as an actress, some of the titles that you may know her from would be um, Pig Girl, uh, Plan 9, House on the Hill. Uh, of course, she was in the original Don't Fuck in the Woods. Uh, Returned to Newcomb High Volume 2, which uh, I, I do seem to recall her being in that. I have to go back and check out all the fine details on that, but um, I should be able uh, to locate her in that. And we're also going to have actor, writer, and <clears throat> somewhat of a special effects artist himself, Cheyenne Gordon. Now, you may know... Cheyenne from a couple of films, primarily as an actor, uh, such as uh, Kill Billies, The Wicked One, Scream for Summer, Betsy, and of course, the upcoming Don't Fuck in the Woods 2. Now, this will be another concept media film, so it's going to continue in the fine line of films that Sean has worked on. In our digital dismemberment spotlights this evening, we will be reviewing Scream Factory's Blu-ray release of Squirm and Anchor Bay Entertainment's release of Lucio Fulci's The Beyond Limited Edition Collector's Tin. Now, two, the, both of these films happen to be favorites of mine, in particular The Beyond. Anything with Lucio Fulci is always very high on my list. And Squirm, for those of you that are fearful of worms and bugs, this is definitely a film that will, haha, make your flesh crawl. And let us not forget about our Metal Massacre Spotlights. And we're going to get to that right away. In our first Metal Massacre Spotlight this evening, we are highlighting the band Flesh Grinder. The CD is from their demo, Rotten Process, and the song is Genital Putrefaction.
And welcome back. You just heard Flesh Grinder. The CD was from their demo, Rotten Process, and the song was Genital Putrefaction. Now, Rotten Process was the first demo CD from Brazilian gore splatter metal band, Flesh Grinder. It was originally released in 1994 and was on the label Millennium Records. The band is still currently going strong, and their current label is Black Hole Productions. Make sure to head on over to www.facebook.com backslash Flesh Grinder Official backslash to find out when they're touring, to pick up their merchandise, and their CDs. Coming up in just a few moments, we're going to have our feature interview this evening with director and producer Sean Burkett, actress Brandy Mason, and actor-writer Cheyenne Gordon of the upcoming concept media films, Don't Fuck in the Woods 2. But before that, it's time for some digital dismemberment. And in our first digital dismemberment spotlight for the evening, we are covering Scream Factory's Blu-ray release of Squirm, directed by Jeff Lieberman. When a powerful storm knocks Fly Creek, Georgia's power lines down onto wet soil, the resulting surge of electricity drives large, bloodthirsty worms to the surface and then out of their soil-tilling mines. Soon, the townspeople discover that their sleepy fishing village is overrun with worms that burrow right into their skins. Inundated by hundreds of thousands of carnivorous creatures, the terrorized locals race to find the cause of the rampage before becoming tilled under themselves. Now, this was the first horror film in writer, producer, director Jeff Lieberman's quirky and stylistic library of films. Squirm was the result of experiments with his brother in the backyard when Jeff was younger, using a train transformer and the electricity it produced to drive worms out of the ground. The film includes the early work effects of Rick Baker with the addition of almost a million glycera worms, which wiped out the supply of worms in New England for almost a year. Some of the early casting ideas included Kim Basinger, Sylvester Stallone, and Martin Sheen. Not a creature feature in the sense of mutations or science gone wrong, the film instead trends towards an accident displacing millions of worms from the ground due to storms and electrical current flowing through the ground. More of a wrong place, wrong time type of deal, Jeff manages to make the small country locations authentic and gives it a sense of isolation once the worms begin flowing and eating the townspeople. Authentic looking and sounding due to using locations in Port Wentworth, Georgia, and the use of many locals, you believe the surroundings and circumstances. Capable acting, camera work, and effects make this film worth watching, all while watching nature run amok. The soundtrack has a way of pleasing the ears as well, and fits the general tone of the film to a T. An underrated film that is certainly finally getting its just due. And to give you a little bit more detail, so spoiler alerts here. The film opens with a narrative telling us about a storm that hits Fly Creek, Georgia in 1975, sending thousands of volts of electricity into the ground. The intensity of the storm rocks the small town, with widespread damage being done to the town and to the electrical wires. The next day we see Jerry, who's played by Patricia Percy, showering. Uh, She's getting ready to pick up her friend Mick, played by Don Scardino. Roger, played by R.A. Dow, is outside cleaning up after the storm for Jerry's mother. The power and water is out at the house, and the mother expresses concern over whether Mick can make it. Jerry asks to borrow Roger's truck to pick up Mick. Roger is at first reluctant, but relents and tells her to be careful as he has a shipment of worms in the back. Now, Mick's bus can't make it into town, so he hops off the bus and walks in. After trudging through the woods, Mick and Jerry meet up and head back to the house. Jerry runs into the local store for ice as Mick goes to the local restaurant to get an egg cream and water. As Mick drinks it, he is shocked to find a worm in it and spills it. As he argues about it with the waitress, the sheriff interjects himself and runs him off. They get back to the house and meet her family, including her sister Alma, played by Fran Higgins. 
As they head out to see someone, Roger stops them and yells at Jerry about a shipment of worms being missing from the back of the truck. Jerry apologizes and she and Mick continue on. When they arrive, Mr. Beardsley, the neighbor, does not answer. They search the property for him and find a skeleton in the backyard. They abruptly rush off to find the sheriff, but when they get back, the skeleton is now missing. The sheriff gets irate, thinking that they are pulling a prank on him. Later, Mick changes clothes at the house and smokes a joint with Alma, where she gives him some details about the town and the people. They head to Quigley's bar to find Beardsley, but he has not been seen there. They run into Roger, and they all agree to go fishing. So when they go to meet Roger at his house, he is not home. They check the shed in the yard and find the skeleton that went missing earlier in the day. They later run into him at the dock and they go fishing. Mick is bitten by one of the worms and goes back to shore, scheming to get the skull as evidence, and Alma winds up seeing it as well. Jerry goes back to fishing with Roger, but he tries to get rough with her on the boat. She struggles with him and pushes him down in the boat. The worms attack and burrow into his face and he falls off of the boat and then runs away. She gets back to the house later and lies to her mother about what really happened. Alma and Mick <clears throat> break into the dentist's office and he compares the teeth x-rays to the ones in the skull. They are shocked to find out that the skull matches the x-rays of the missing man Beardsley. When they get back, Jerry tells Mick about the worms attacking Roger. They head to the worm farm and try to find them, but Mick finds Roger's father, his torso eaten away by worms. They rush to find the sheriff again, but he is having dinner with his mistress and refuses to believe their story. They leave, unsure of what to do next other than to head back to Beardsley's house to search for more clues. They head back to their house for dinner, and while eating, a huge tree falls on the house. They find tons of worms under the roots and plan to burn them, but the sun sunlight drives the worms back underground. Mick runs out to get wood to seal up the house, but is attacked by Roger in the woods and is left for dead. As night falls, the worms start showing up around town and devouring anyone in their path, including the sheriff. Mick makes it back to the house, only to find it worm-infested and with Roger waiting. Do Mick, Jerry, and Alma survive the onslaught of the worms and Ro Roger's jealous rampage, or do they face the same fate as others in the town? You're going to have to watch the film to find out. And, you know, this film was released a year before I was born, so I, I really, really enjoyed being able to go back and watch this cult classic on Blu-ray. Again, I, I kind of feel like it's a lost film for today's generations, where you kind of you have a horror film where it's not a slasher or an alien <clears throat> or something really super science, scientifically horrific that went wrong. This is simply a nature run amok film, and I think films like this are very much a rarity in today's films. Now, as far as the special features go, uh, another great film released from Screen Factory. Uh, you have Digging In, The Making of Squirm Featurette, which is about 33 minutes long. It's an excellent retrospective interview with Jeff Lieberman and Don Scardino discussing how the concept for the film came about, the cast and crew, the locations, Rick Baker's effects work, problems on set, and the creative ways they fixed them, in addition to audience reactions and, of course, the worms. It's really a wealth of information on every aspect of the film, including the dist distribution end. Eureka with Jeff Lieberman, which runs about seven minutes. Jeff takes, takes us on a tour of his old house where the idea for Squirm came from. He shows us the old Lionel train transformer and talks about how his brother showed him how to run the electricity into the ground to draw the worms up, and even shows us one of the last prop worms from the film. It also includes the original theatrical trailer, a 55 second TV spot with alternate footage, there's a one minute radio trailer and a still gallery, and also included because this was one of the earlier releases from Scream Factory were trailers from other Scream Factory releases that included Pumpkinhead, Motel Helm, and The Beast Within. It is a one disc set, it's an NTSC format in color, it's unrated, and the aspect ratio is 1080p high definition widescreen, 185.1. 
So, you know, as, as far as it goes, once again, Scream Factory has brought us a 70s classic horror film that is more than deserving of the Blu-ray upgrade. This version is far superior to the MGM UA triple feature DVD release that also included Swamp Thing and Return of the Living Dead released in 2011. And the MGM UA single disc DVD released, uh, which was released in 2003. The clarity of the film is amazing, barely re retaining any scratches or grain. The sound is also vastly superior and rich. As with most Scream Factory titles, the, li the delight is in the special features. The digging in, the making of Scream feature is highly informative and Jeff does an outstanding job detailing the issues on the set and how he came about with the concept of the film. The Eureka featurette was cool as well, taking us back to the house where he grew up and giving us the backstory on how he and his brother used a train conductor and electricity to drive worms from the ground. This is certainly the definitive version of this film, and you will find fewer examples of a well-put-together Blu-ray release. Special mention also goes to the unique cover art Scream Factory put together for this release as well. Once again, this release is the perfect example of why Shout and Scream Factory sets the standards for Blu-ray horror releases. Overall, I'd give this movie a 3.5 out of 5. I'd give the Blu-ray rating a 7 out of 10. So make sure to head on over to ScreamFactory.com to pick up your Blu-ray release of the collector's edition of Squirm. Coming up in just a few moments, we're going to have our feature interview with director and producer Sean Burkett, actress Brandy Mason, and actor-writer Cheyenne Gordon of the upcoming film Don't Fuck in the Woods 2. But before that, we're going to go into our second Metal Massacre spotlight this evening. The name of the band is Gorgoroth, the CD is Twilight of the Idols, and the song is Exit Through Carved Stones. <laughs>
welcome back. You just heard the band Gorgoroth. The CD was Twilight of the Idols, and the song was Exit Through Carved Stones. Twilight of the Idols is the sixth album by Norwegian black metal band Gorgoroth. It was released on the 21st of July 2003 through Nuclear Blast and was reissued in 2006 by Back on Black Records. Make sure to head on over to www.facebook.com backslash Gorgoroth official backslash to find out when they're going to be on tour to pick up the great band merchandise and to pick up their CDs. But now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to go into our feature interview. And now it's time for our feature interview. Tonight, I'm going to have on the man I have had on the show twice before, and that is none other other than producer, editor, director, and just about every damn thing else you can do on a film, and that is Sean Burkett. But not only do I have Sean on with us, I also have with us Brandy Mason and Cheyenne Gordon, both two important people who will be a part of Sean's Next big project, Don't Fuck in the Woods 2. Everyone, how you doing this evening? Pretty good. How about you? <laughs> not bad, not bad. I, you know, I've been looking forward to this one for for quite a while now. Um, God, I think Sean was on the podcast last about three years ago, and I think that was for Midsummer Nightmare, uh, if I recall correctly, wasn't it, Sean? Yeah, yeah, the first one was. And then I remember you guys were you were just going into production on Don't Fuck in the Woods when I interviewed you the second time. So, you know, uh, Sean, let, let, we'll start with you. Um, you know, of course, as I said, producer, editor, director, Don't Fuck in the Woods, I found to be an absolutely fun film to watch. There were so many elements that I feel like a lot of independent film direct directors are not bringing the projects and you brought the creature feature back in a very fun and graphic way. There's no other way to put that, you know, what was, what's been the critical response for that? And what made you decide that don't fuck in the woods Two was the next step. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of, like, I heard everything you just said, but I couldn't help but smile throughout the entire thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, well, oh, let's take that in. Um, wow. What was the question? <laughs> what Basically, what has been the critical response to Don't Fuck in the Woods? And, and, you know, what from that has made you decide to make the leap to going into a sequel? Honestly, the first one ended up being something that I, I never dreamed it would be, even though I'm not happy with the final cut of it. A lot of people are, but at the same point in time, a lot of people hate it as well. Um, but it was just one of those things that it got so much attention, whether it was good attention or bad attention. But still, I mean, people wanted it. They wanted to see it. So it's like... You know, after a limited run of releasing it and then independent festivals all across the U.S., um, I'm not going to lie. I did not want to go back to Don't Fuck in the Woods. Right. Like, I just, for, I, I, it was a rough experience. I mean, you got to think that was four years of my life walking into woods, around woods, to fucking yellow jacket attack and so many like things that had to overcome um yeah i just did not want to go back but i did don't fuck in the woods and then i did another film called betsy which is like a werewolf um drama maybe right um and I started getting a lot of emails from people like, I think it's great that you're tackling, you know, like creatures, because now a lot of people are doing that. <laughs> and at, at that point, um, I mean, after Don't Fuck in the Woods got uh, distribution via Gravitas Ventures, 
I just felt like a part of, I mean, a part of me wanted to know how it was going to end because I left the first one open to a sequel. And it's one of those things that I just want to try to get it out while I'm <laughs> still able to and not completely like, no, I'm not going back in the goddamn woods. <laughs> I mean, that's honesty. And, you know, I appreciate that because a lot of times, I remember my ex-wife used to think that when I worked on films, it was all sex, drugs, rock and roll, and partying. And I tried to tell her that there is more work that goes into doing these independent films than anyone ever believes. So I truly understand how you feel, you know, about that. <clears throat> now, we have Brandy Mason as well. She's an actress. She's worked in the makeup department, uh, producers, special effects, all kinds of things like that. And she is going to be playing Meg in Don't Fuck in the Woods 2. Now, Brandy, tell us what you found unique about the original and how you got involved in being a part of the second one. Okay, um, well, originally um, I had seen the casting call for it. And I was like, oh my God, I got to be involved in this project just because of the name alone. And um, so, I, you know, I sent the stuff to Sean and he's like, okay, yeah, you're you got the part. Oh, yes, awesome. Um, but when it, when I did it, you know, it just it felt very surreal because it's always something that I've you know wanted to do. I do horror films and stuff like that. And I've done a couple other horror films leading up to this, and I was like, I know for a fact when I did this one that I nailed it, that it was solid, and um, I, I felt really good about it and everything. And then once I saw it, um, because I know Sean wanted to film some more scenes for my character, but we just ran out of daylight. Um, he had to leave early, I think, for something. And so it left the rest of us on set. It left Roman, uh, who played Mac in the movie, uh, behind the camera. And he ended up finishing filming the scenes. We just ran out of daylight. And then, but I feel like the footage that we got was pretty solid with, you know, my character and the rest of the film. Because Basically, the beginning sets up, um, you know, the the feel and the mood and everything for the, the rest of the entire film, which I thought was pretty good because I think some of the actors and actresses didn't have a whole lot of experience, but I felt like they did a really good job. I think, was this, Sean, was this Brittany's first film? It was. I think she did a really great job, and... Um, a lot of the actors, I think, didn't have, like, a whole lot of experience, but I thought they, everyone did a really great job overall. I felt like it was a good film, and I know Sean beats himself up. Like you said earlier, he didn't like the final cut of it, but I felt like it was a good, fun film. And um, you can see where we had fun in, like, the behind-the-scenes outtakes at the end of it. Uh, in the scene where I'm with uh, Scott, I think it was originally supposed to be another actor, but he was double booked and he couldn't make it. But Scott ended up playing my boyfriend. And um, I was feeding him a line, telling him when we were in the tent, because he goes one or two. And I was like, two. And, I, and he's supposed to say, I'm going to get ball seeds and that ass and do some colon bowling. But he kept saying colon blowing. And everybody was laughing and <laughs> couldn't get the line. <laughs> I hope Sean uses it in the second one. <laughs> I mean, that, that was pretty good. And I'm going to get back to that <clears throat> in a second. But right. I also right. I also right. want to so, introduce... Oh, go ahead. That, uh, but I'm going to go ahead to, like, the, the second one. But when people are always like, oh, it doesn't end well for you because you die. And I'm like, but it just, so this is before I was approached by Sean to be in the second one. I was like, it doesn't technically show me die. So you never know. I could pop back up if he does a second one. And so I just totally joked about it for the longest time. And then Sean contacted me and was like, hey, you want to be in the second one? And uh, I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> okay, we're, we're going to come back to that to that tent sequence because I have – I'm going to ask you guys a serious question about that. But before I do, um, I also want to introduce Cheyenne Gordon. He's an actor, writer, okay. director, special effects, producer, you know, the whole nine yards. Now, Cheyenne, for you – you know, you, you have a writing credit for Don't Fuck in the Woods 2. You're going to be acting in it as Gil. Kind of talk about for you how you became involved with this project. 
Um, first of all, can you guys hear me okay? I know Brandy said I sounded muffled earlier. Yeah, you sound you sound good. Sean had mentioned anything that just happened to 
create a scene in my head to like Sean Reed. I was like, hey, this is kind of like the feeling you're going for. And he was like, that's fucking awesome. And uh, and then we just kind of like, we just started tag team and back and forth. I'd write some scenes, he'd write some scenes, and I would play off what he wrote, he'd play off what I wrote. And it's just this really fun kind of like, with, with no boundaries and not having to hold to, am I allowed to do this? Is this okay? Is this socially acceptable? When you throw all that out the window and you just fucking have fun with it, like it's been an amazing experience for me, and it's definitely been the greatest most like time working on film ever thus far. And we haven't even started filming; like it's literally just been the writing and creating process. Now, <clears throat> Brandy, let me go back to you because I, I think this really hits on social subtext today. And I'll and this will tie into a question for Sean and Cheyenne as well. But you know, you look at the current state of Hollywood and all the scandals that are going on and all of those things. And one of the things that I think Sean really brought back to the forefront of indie genre films is how much nudity, sexuality was in don't fuck in the woods. You know, it's 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 a lost art. If you go back to the 70s and 80s, sex really played a big part in a lot of these films. For your character of Meg, you know, you talk about that opening scene in the tent. You know, how how do you view that in terms of how things are socially these days? You know, to you was it an empowering role? Did you find it to be more of a tongue-in-cheek thing? You know, how how did that all come across to you? Um, well, um, I never really thought of it that way. Um, I guess I just thought, you know, it's like, oh, it's just nudity. That's kind of how I just see it, as, oh, it's just nudity. Everybody's naked, everybody has sex, and I, I don't know, I just, I treat it like a Monday through Friday, nine to five job. That's how I it. So it, it does feel empowering, though, um, knowing that I can do that. And, um, you know, it, there's a, a certain crowd that's going to like it, um, obviously. The, your true horror fans will get it and they'll understand it. And, um, you know, it does feel empowering. I remember back in the spring, um, I was talking to my brother, and he was in some group on Facebook, and I think it had 30,000 followers, and he posted a picture of me um, from some photo shoot that I had done with another person, and he didn't even say my name. He's like, this is my sister, and Brandy, and they go, some guy commented on it and said, oh, as in that horror actress, Brandy Mason, that's your sister, and he's like, yeah, and he's like, what? He's like, really? That's your sister? And he's like, Yeah. And I asked him who the guy was, and he told me, and I looked him up, and I didn't have any mutual friends with him. So, apparently, I think that's right around the time Don't Fuck in the Woods was starting to kind of hit big, and it was doing well, like, on IMDb and stuff. Um, I think, wasn't it back in the spring, Sean, when, I guess, Don't Fuck in the Woods was, like... Pirated? Uh, getting ar- yeah, pirated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was actually, like, getting around, like, pretty big. Um, so, yeah, it felt kind of weird. Because that was, like, the first, um, you know, time I felt, like, kind of famous, I guess, say, um, you know, like, oh, my name's getting out there. But, yeah, it does feel empowering, um, especially with everything that's going on. And it's interesting that a lot of people will say, well, I'm not a prude, but as soon as you mention doing, um, when they're like, what kind of type of work do you do? And you tell them what type of work you do, and they just kind of, like, look at you and shrivel up. And it's like, well, let's see here. Betty White has done nudity before. And, you know, she's a, a very well-revered actress. Right. Um, there's a lot of actresses that have done nudity in their early careers, um, you know, and they're considered some of the top-tier actresses out there. So I do think it's more of an empowering thing, like, you know, basically, like, fuck you to <laughs> people like Mike Pence, you know, <laughs> basically what it is. Now, yeah, I would go with empowering, for sure. Now, Sean, for you, did you, you know, did you catch any flack or did do you did you hear of the film catching any flack for the gratuitous? And and I'm, when I'm saying gratuitous, I mean it in the most pleasant way as possible. Like I said, I find it to be I, I know that sounds funny to say that. But like I said, you know, I'm going to be 42 in in February. So, uh, you know, I go a little bit further back in terms of re- remembering when 
it was more of a staple of the genre than what it is now, you know, but for you, Sean, you know, did you catch any flack? Did the film catch any flack? You know, did, did you ever catch whiff of, you know, people saying, oh, that's so misogynistic, you know, that's this, that's that? Surprisingly, no. The only thing that I ever got was a lot of people complaining that there wasn't enough nudity. Wow. Right. I mean, there's a decent amount of nudity in there. I mean, there's definitely more nudity in that film than there is certainly in the average genre film these days. That's that's the only reason why I wondered, because like I said, it's, you know, it seems like there's a very divisive line right now in the genre about how women are portrayed on film, you know, and it's, you know, it's, it's a hard subject to talk about because if, if you, if you say something and one person takes it the wrong way, it seems like all of a sudden there's a holy crusade against you for saying it, whatever it was that you said. And, you know, I fully, you know, I compliment Brandy highly, not, and I don't mean it to sound, you know, you know, she's, she's a, a, a beautiful woman. She looked great on film, but it wasn't, it wasn't so much per se the nudity that made me or that reminds me of her. I, I thought her role was well done. And, you know, from what you and I have talked about, I'm looking forward to what her role is in the second one. You know, <clears throat> as writers now, like this is for both Sean and Cheyenne, you know, that's that's a tough act to follow up for a sequel. You know, it's you know, the sequels are usually more gore, more nudity, more sex, more violence, you know. As as writers, you know, how how do you go about topping what you did in the first one and expanding it in a capacity that makes sense and not just for the sake of having it? Um, and either one of you can can answer that. Whoever wants to answer that first. Giant, feel free. Feel yeah. free. So a little little bit of a backstory, real quick, about how I deal with the nudity. So I'm, number one, I'm not a not a huge fan of movie and, and film in general unless it, it, it has a reason to be in there that it pushes the story forward. Um, you know, people call me a clue, but I'm just like, you know what, if, if you have to have nudity, then you're not telling me the story. If you choose to have nudity, that's different. So that being said, you know, I went into working on this knowing that, okay, yeah, there's going to be a lot of nudity, there's going to be a lot of fucking um, but I kind of, like, you know, Sean was right. I kind of just, like, pushed the sex scenes on him. Like, hey, you know what you're doing. You know what you want to show people. Just deal, deal with it that way. But I think what it is, that honestly, the way you up it is that, yeah, you have the first movie where there's tons of sex and there's, there's nudity everywhere. In the sequel, wanted to top what the first one did, per se. Um, and, and, and so far, I mean, we do have a gratuitous amount of nudity in, in the sequel, at least in my opinion. Would I say it tops the first one? Probably equal, if not a little bit more. But the idea of it is now that you've shown the face of the sex and nudity in the first one, the second one, we wanted to kind of get cute about it and have almost like a subtext to it or a, a sub. So, um, I don't even know the word I'm really looking for. It, it just because most of the sex in the movie and some parts of it too, it's almost a uh, euphemism for STD. Sure. Um, and, and that was kind of what me and Sean were joking about. I told him that the other day when, when we were kind of talking about it. I was like, you know, there's like an underlying theme of like STDs in this, right? And he kind of laughed, and I was like, that, that's cool, though, because it's, it's almost like this thing of, of if you pay attention to it and you really kind of key into what we're doing, it, it's fun, because you're like, that, that's funny. But then at the same time, <laughs> with, with what you were talking about, this whole, you know, how women are portrayed and, and how a lot of people feel it's demeaning for women to always be portrayed in a sexual manner or the nudity or whatever. Me and Sean have actually taken a stab at that you know, too to kind of turn the genre on its head a bit. Um, Sean, is it cool if I kind of talk about Tasha just for a second? Yeah, go for it. So there's a character in this film called named Tasha that we're still trying to, to kind of cast right now. Um, and her character is obviously a sexually promiscuous girl. She's the wild child. She's the one that will literally fuck anything and everything in her past. Um, 
And usually when you look at characters like that in war films, the, you know, I, I don't know if anybody wants to say, but kind of the bloody character, the one that's willing to just screw anything, they're usually portrayed as being not very intelligent, um, shallow, stupid, just that's all they're good for is sex. Right. But with Costa, we kind of do it, we kind of turn the trope on its head a bit. She's highly sexual and is like just screwing everything, but at the same time, when she talks, she's insanely intelligent. So, you know, a character will be like, well, um, I was being fascist. And then she would correct, correct and be like, facetious. Or when a character asks about, you know, do you know how much a fucking 400 pound, or a, do you know how much a fucking full grown brown bear weighs? And she's the first one off in the corner going 500 pounds, fully grown. Like, that character usually wouldn't know those things. Right. But for us, like, let's make this, this character that likes to have sex and is sexually promiscuous, let's make her intelligent as shit. Because people won't expect that. Um, and then on top of all of that, I think Don't Fuck in the Woods 1 was more of let's just show sex. Let's not dive into how it's visually portrayed or how it can visually affect somebody. But with with the second one, with Don't Fuck in the Woods 2, when Sean wrote these scenes, you know, I see it in my head. I'm sure he does too. We play it as a scene in our head. And we're looking at these angles like, man, these are some words of angles. This is going to get pretty intimate. Even though there's no real emotion there, no romantic motion for some of it, it's like, it's still going to be a beautiful and intimate shot, which can really push that sexuality over that edge more than just showing two people having sex just to show it. You know what I mean? Sure. Sean, for you, I mean, you know, basically the same thing, you know, <clears throat> you know, I know, you know, you talk about visualizing it and as an effects artist, you know, I, I get, I get that too. Cause I have to be able to share a vision with a director, but like for you, when you're, when you're thinking about this, when you're, when you're plotting this out, you know, how, how in your mind are you, are you looking to portray it? I mean, 90% of the time I want to make sure that it's something that hasn't been done before. Um, I'm not gonna lie. I, I kind of reference uh, Sleepaway Camp Two quite a bit to to shine in. Like that's what I like. That that's always the thing for me when I was younger. It was a staple in my horror collection. And it's like there's some impressive like sliding shots and just like they went different for a lot of the sex scenes because they didn't want to just make them your standard sex scene. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I take that into consideration, and then, I'm not going to lie, half the time I'm like, how can we outdo this? And then it's, how can we outdo this, plus transition into the next scene, make it just some people haven't seen before, or at least I haven't seen before. Cheyenne knows exactly what I'm talking about, and I can't wait to try that scene. <laughs> now, Brandy... <clears throat> You know, having done a little bit of acting myself, you know, I, I know how it is when you got to when you got to try and hype yourself up for a particular scene. You know, um, I've never done any intimate scenes uh, in a film like that. But like for you as an actress, how do you mentally prepare for something like that? What is, what would be your process? Um, flirt a lot with your co-star because. Um, chemistry, chemistry to me is the biggest thing. Um, a lot of times when I work with people and I have to do intimacy scenes, I prefer to work with people that I don't know because it's more awkward than if people you do know, especially if you've been friends with them for a while and um, you do an intimacy scene with them. Um, but you already know you have chemistry with that person. But if you don't know the person, you don't know if you have, you know, if you have chemistry with them until you get there and you get on set. So. Flirting a little bit helps. Um, you know, you don't want to go overboard with it because you don't want to be unprofessional. But, like, joking around and flirting and cutting up uh, really helps me a lot with, you know, doing with getting set up for stuff like that um, so that I can actually have, like, the chemistry with the person so it's like we know each other so I feel comfortable. Um, usually I'm having to tell the guys, like, it's okay to actually touch me, you know, touch my breast, kiss my breast, stuff like that, and, you know, do whatever you need to do to make it look like we're actually having sex without actually having sex with me. Sure. Um, so it helps them get, you know, comfortable and everything like that. So that's usually how I, and, and I still do get nervous every time I have to do it until I start doing it, um, you know, and then I'm okay with it. 
after a few minutes because you know like I said it's like kind of like being with somebody for the first time but kind of (laughs) not no and I hope you don't mind me asking a question (laughs) you know because it's 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 an interesting dynamic that I don't you don't read a lot or you don't hear a lot about in interviews, people usually don't talk about their process with that, but what you're saying makes perfect sense. You know, I can only equate it to, you know, doing like action stunt scenes and it's, you know, it's like having to hype yourself up and just be in that moment and sometimes just forget about everything else that's going around. You know, you got to forget about the camera. You got to forget about the crew sitting there. And, and, you know, like you talk about some of the, the, um, the gag cut scenes at the, at the end of the first one where, you know, there's the flub with the lines and everything. And, you know, I could only imagine how funny it was having to go through those scenes. You know, you get certain parts of, of the intimate part, right. And then a line gets flubbed and everyone laughs and you have to set up and do it again. So no, I, I really appreciate you answering the question because I think it's something that a lot of people don't realize how involved sometimes that process is in getting yourself into the mindset to do certain things. Right. Now, one one of the things that really stood out to me for an independent film and and knowing what the budget was for Don't Fuck in the Woods was the amazing creature in in that film. And, you know, Sean, uh, you know, when you had the creature made, you know, was it everything that you envisioned in your mind? Because like I said, for, for your budget and what you guys pulled off, that was one of the more amazing creature effects that I've seen in independent film. Well, thank you. It took us several thousand dollars to end up with a $150 folk suit. <laughs> it really did. It really did. But I, I do feel like the final result was better than anything we tried before. I mean, I, I thought actually, it was... I thought it was quite stunning. I mean, you know, from an effect standpoint, looking at that, you know, it's, you know, it might sound like ass kissing to say it, but I mean, you you know, when I first saw the creature, I'm sitting there and, you know, the first words that pop into my mind are names like, you know, um, Stan Winston, you know, um, Rob Bottin, you know, people who, who do these kinds of things. I'm like, holy shit, who the hell did Sean get to do this? And it, it just came across so well, you know, and Brandy for you, you know, when, when you were on set and you have your first, your very first interaction with the creature suit, you know, how was that for you? Were you, were you just as surprised or a shock? No, I thought it looked really good. Um, I, by the time we were like laying there, uh, like I said, we were, we were getting close to like running out of daylight, but yeah, it looked really good in person and everything. I was very surprised when they told me you know what they did to to get it and everything and um it was interesting because scott actually was the monster too so he had to kill himself <laughs> <laughs> and uh and then he had to end up uh attacking me so you know it was all it was fun it was well done and everything and um i know when they were doing the scratches on me we were playing around with latex and stuff earlier and we just couldn't get it right so it was ryan stacy um he just ended up taking some dirt and um, big blood and putting it across me to look like the scratches. That's all he used was dirt on the ground and big blood. And, uh, looked really good. <laughs> Now, Cheyenne, from you, you know, you have experience with effects as well. You know, what were your thoughts on seeing the creature in the film and how, how, how does, how you view the creature shape the way that you're helping to write this, the screenplay for this? Right now, Sean's asshole is clenching up. I can hear it whistling right now. Right now, he's going, be nice, fucker, be nice. All right. Um, so I asked Sean about the, the, the original creature suit because I've actually seen it. Um, when I went over to Sean to work on Betsy, I actually saw it hanging up on the wall. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, what the fuck is that over there? And he goes, that's the so fucking the woods creature suit. I, was, I just looked at it for a minute, looked at him, and I was like, how in the flying fuck did you get that to look like it did the film? And he was like, uh, Vaseline and really low lighting. And I'm like, motherfucker, it works. All right. Like that's something, and and what you don't, I don't know. Actually, just watch the movie 
Um, if you'll notice, I don't believe there's really any moment until closer to the end, like the very end, that you just straight up see the full monster in halfway decent lighting or even the detail, like really good detail. Right. Um, and I know that, like, I was, I'm actually working on a statue right now of the creature. Um, and so I'm like, hey, Sean, can you send me some, like, pictures of the suit and stuff so I can kind of get an idea of what this looking like <laughs> and so he sends me he sends me pictures of being being dark and I'm like dude I can't see any fucking detail like I almost look at this place and he goes alright don't judge <laughs> light shining on it like lit up and I'm just sitting there looking at it going the fucking hole like oh, god damn it Sean <laughs> <laughs> Now, one of the other things... Oh, go ahead. see but to me that's the right way to do it i think a lot of films these days and i hate to use this term but i you know with the with the wealth of experience that you guys have and all of the different departments in filmmaking i think you guys understand this i think sometimes a lot of indie films take the shortcut of using too much cgi and and it really detracts from the film more than it helps it yeah it does. right you know i think it's No, you're you're a hundred percent right, and and again, you know, it's like I said, you know, watching the film and looking at it through an effects artist's eyes, you know, I just I can't impress upon you how much how much I was impressed by everything that I saw. <clears throat> now, another element of "Don't Fuck in the Woods" that I thought was vitally important, and again, a lot of films don't seem to nail this. I don't know if it's on an acting end. I don't know if it's a director's vision. I don't know if it's the writing, but one of the things that the film really hit on is it had the perfect blend of, I don't want to say comedic relief, but it certainly had its moments of levity 
in comedy where you sit there and you laugh. I watched it with a buddy of mine, and I hadn't heard him laugh that hard during a horror movie while enjoying it at the same time. You know, Sean, first for you, you know, with with the blend of comedic that you put in or that's in the film, you know, how much of that was actually written by you and how much of that was um improvisation how much of it was what the actors brought in the heat of the moment well considering we're referring to mr roman (laughs) joe um there was quite a bit of it that was written but it's one of those things that the way i i work with actors and i'm just like this is the point that I want you to get across. Say it how you would say it, because I feel that that would be more believable than, I don't don't know, some people, like, when they memorize their lines, it's almost like they have this stare that they're reading the lines in their head. Right. Uh, Like they're robotic. Right, so, you know, I'm sorry, I I did not remember lines, so therefore I kind of don't expect my cast to. (laughs) But... Roman, Roman, he took he took a little bit of uh, well, I guess he just put a lot more of himself in it. Maybe I don't. Know. Um, there were a couple lines that definitely were written. There were quite a few lines that didn't make it into the final cut because I just felt like that could be a possible lawsuit. Oh. <laughs> um, um, no, I don't think it would have been a lawsuit, but it's just something like. I've never heard anybody say that in an independent film, which kind of made me want to put it in there. Sure. But at the same point in time, I was like, I don't know enough people hate me for putting fuck in a title. I don't need this in there. (laughs) Now, Brandy, well, I was going to say, Brandy, for you, you know, being on set as an actress, you know, can you kind of talk about, how the camaraderie was between you, the cast, you know, the rest of the crew, because when you watch the outtakes at the end, you know, you really get the feeling that it was a close set, that that it was almost, you know, like the best of friends getting together and having such a great fucking time making a film, you know. Was it like that for you on set? Yeah, I mean, by the, by the end of filming, um, I definitely felt like, comfortable uh cutting up and i think at one point i was like i was naked and it was when they were going to drag me across the ground on the tarp and i was like oh i was laying there i was like oh i'm gassy i think i have to fart and they're like well fart and i was like no i'm laying here naked i was like, do it and i was like okay so i think i farted i got it i farted but it wasn't like it wasn't loud or anything and they're like did you fart yet i was like yeah he probably don't want to listen to me <laughs> it was just stuff like that, like burping and, and stuff. And I was the only female on set, so but I felt totally comfortable. Um, everybody made it cool. Everyone was professional, so it was really nice. You know, it was a good experience. Now, Cheyenne, for you, you know, seeing how close that the cast and the crew were on the original, you know, what challenges do you feel like that presents to you being one of the writers for the film? You know, how do you try to try and replicate that feeling, that 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 closeness that was there between the characters? Um, well, I mean, it, again, I'm kind of known as the, the character development writer. Um, so uh, I know I can write an action in a, in a sex scene. But I feel like you don't connect with the character as well. So Sean has noticed this night, and Sean keeps telling me to shut up. And I apologize for it. Like, every day I'm messaging him. I'm like, dude, I'm sorry if I'm being really worried here if I'm dragging the scene out. Like, it's just, I'm seeing how these people are interacting with each other. So when it comes to that, um, this camaraderie is I treat these characters as if, obviously, if they're real. A lot of it is pulled, pulled from real conversations that I've had with my friends because me and my friends, as much as we adore each other and love each other and we take a bullet for each other, we are the most horrendously evil people to each other imaginable. Like, we say shit to each other. Like, any normal humans would say that to you, they would probably stab you. But because we're so funny, we can get away with it. We can joke around with it. So I look at some of these 
Sean has a favorite line in the movie we've written so far where somebody calls tell somebody they smell like they they're like, Hey, you smell like this person's dick. <laughs> Sean is quacking up about it and he keeps like posting shit about it like I fucking love this line. It's jokes like that or remarks like that between the characters that bring them realism and brings them closer. If you don't care about your characters, if you don't hate them, if you don't love them, if you don't sympathize for them, then nobody gets the flying shit if they die. And I, in all the films I've worked on, especially this one, I want people to care. And I think we've done that so well now that, you know, I have Sean and me talking to like, God damn it, do we really want to kill this character? Because, I mean, they're kind of fucking awesome. And, and we ran into that several times already. And when you run into that as a writer, you know you've done it right. You know you've done a character just. You've taken a character that is a trope, a stoner, the jock, the slut, the nerd, the whatever. But you've made them special and unique to the point that people are going to care what you do to them. Or they'll hate them and want them dead. You want some sort of emotional connection to that. <laughs> with, with what I plan on trying to do, you know, I'm, you know, Sean had talked to me about possibly being a second unit director. I'm an actor's director. I act, so I usually spend 95% of my time on a set with my actors. Sure. And I allow my crew to do their job. That's what they're there to do. I can't babysit everybody to do all their jobs. Let me do my job and deal with the actors. Um, and when I do that, I notice a lot of actors are very surprised by that because they, they've worked with directors you know like hey did you like that yeah it's fine they don't give them any feedback me dude I'm sitting there going okay try it like this okay well imagine if this was happening how would you react to that um so just that I think that's going to help build camaraderie between me and the crew that's already been there together mm-hmm. and with, with Brandy who's been on set with these people before and she's already going to feel comfortable I've never been on the set with any of these people with the exception of Sean and Roman, that, that's going to be it. Um, you know, and TJ, there's a couple that I've worked with in the past, but when it comes to, like, the actors and people that have been involved in the first one, I'm the new guy. So it's my job to try and, like, make everybody as comfortable as possible when it comes to, like, their acting and how their characters are portrayed. Well, you know, going going along with everything that you just said, and, of course, being, you know, the new guy on the crew, you know, <clears throat> what is... In, in your eyes, what is it that you, besides the character development and things like that, that's going to up the game? What are you hoping to push across that takes Don't Fuck in the Woods 2 to that next level? Um, again, where I mentioned about turning the classic tropes on their head upside down and cluster fucked all around. Right. That's my... I want, I want people to be surprised. I want people in that movie and, and not I wouldn't say a twist but to be not expecting what the normal trope of a creature feature or a horror movie is so people would be like wow I didn't expect myself to be rooting for this character I thought I would hate this character at the beginning now I fucking love this character or to take other characters be like hey whatever happened to Brandy now we know what happened to Brandy and people are like shit totally wasn't expecting that <laughs> like I want people to be surprised and entertained at the same time because if you don't try to up your game and to try and surprise people, you're literally just cookie cutting the same story. Sure. Now, Brandy, for you, you know, same question. You know, you were there for the first one. You know, I know that your character plays some, you know, an important role in this one. You know, what are you looking to do or hoping to show that will take your character in the film to the next level? Um, I really can't say a whole lot about it. I really can't say who has to talk it at all. Because, <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> Let me think a lot. Um, she's feisty in this one. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, because I don't want you to give away too much. I don't want to piss Sean off. I like having Sean on the show. Right. That's, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I can't really, I can't really say much about it. Oh, I'm casting it, and I'm feisty. So <laughs> it turns out that she was an alien the whole time. Yeah. So, somehow that wouldn't that's surprise like, me. Every, that's why my character likes it in the butt so much. Apparently. Exactly. <laughs> well, Sean, again, same question for you. You know, I think you, I think you really turned a lot of heads with the first one. Like I said, I feel like you really brought a lot of the tropes and the things that were missing in our genre back. Things things that we had seen in the past, but people have just seemed to forgot about or just don't know how to do. 
you know, what are your hopes with the second one? I mean, you, you definitely took the independent film and I think you raised the bar for indie features. What what are you really hoping to push out there this second time? I would, I would definitely have to say something that at least in, in my thoughts, in, in my, my head, a little more organized. Um, that, that's one of the main reasons why we're definitely going to be running um, two camera units, four cameras total, uh, because we want to make sure that we get all the shots and all the scenes. Like, that's one thing about Don't Fucking Woods that I really dislike is that we just ran out of daylight to where we couldn't shoot scenes. Like, there were almost seven scenes that were cut from Don't Fuck in the Woods because we ran out of time. Mm. And I feel those scenes would have made it flow a little better. It's like, okay, we're we're at the main campsite one night, and then Roman's asleep, and we jump to another campsite where this other couple's camping. It's like, where the fuck did they come from? Like, there were a whole scene. Um, um, it would have been uh, Derek Worley and uh, Kayla okay. Morgan. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah. Like, that's right because there was yeah there was that one scene where you switched to another campsite and it's kind of like who you know where did these people come from you know the, we know these aren't the missing friends no i get what you're saying definitely yeah we had this whole we had a scene when they went off to when they initially got to the camp they went off um let's see it would have been Aisha howard roman Josart, hannah burt and Bricky blanton um and they have a little creek scene they were originally supposed to go hiking and they run into these other two hikers um, and they just have a conversation. Like, all of that ended up having to get cut. Now, just to clarify it for people, I mean, and, it, and if it's giving away too much, you certainly don't have to answer it, but can you clarify a little bit more what the monster is? Is it based off of an Ohio legend? You know, is it based off of mythology of another creature? I'm not going to lie, like, I... Based, and this was okay when we first started to make the creature for this film. This was before the Michael Bay reboot of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was like literally, like as we were gearing up for production, pictures started emerging for that film. So it was like, well, fuck, I guess we're not going to put a shell on this damn thing. Um, <laughs> because in my head, it was based more off of animals that can be found in the woods of Ohio. I mean, between, um, honestly, there was supposed to be a little bit of predator slash of a chameleon aspect to it, as well as a, a box turtle and a snake. Well, you know, it's Which funny it's, of... it's funny that you say predator because my buddy and I who, who were watching it, that was one of the first things he said was, man, you know, you almost get a predator vibe off of this creature. Right. Wait, I'm not going to lie. Predator was a huge influence for that film. Um, I have to say the two films that I studied the most would have been uh, Predator and Creature from the Black Lagoon. Yes, yes. Yeah, you can see that. Yes, I definitely got that Creature from the Black Lagoon vibe off of it as well. <laughs> now... <clears throat> Just to give people an idea, you guys are going to start shooting in 2018, you know, in terms of filming and everything, you know, are you looking to bring in, you know, new cameras? Are you going to use the same cameras that you used before? You know, what are you looking at in that department? Um, we're still going to run all Black Magic cameras. I just, I really love the quality that I can get out of a Black Magic camera. Um, We'll be running um, one of the Blackmagic cinema cameras, um, two Blackmagic micros, and a Blackmagic pocket, which the first film was shot mainly on the pocket. Um, there were two scenes that were actually filmed uh, on the cinema camera, uh, but one of those scenes was the end, to where we actually used three different cameras. Uh, the DJI Osmo, uh, the pocket camera, and the cinema camera. Mm-hmm. No, and I, I, th I think you guys got amazing quality out of those cameras. I know right after we finished watching it, first thing I did was jump online and look that camera up. And, you know, you, you look at a lot of stuff these days, people are shooting on red, you know, all kinds of different digital cameras and stuff. And I was just absolutely stunned at the price point of that camera and the quality that you got out of it. Right. I think a lot of people anymore, I mean, I don't want this to come out wrong, but it's like, if 
you're a consumer and you see a lot of advertisements for one specific thing, you're going to gravitate more towards that thing. Sure. It's like, I would love to shoot on a rep, but physically, I mean, wow, I would need a massive ex extended hard drive. I would basically need to buy a new computer, like just to be able to edit the footage. So it's like, sure, that would be great. And it would look way more closer to a major motion picture. But honestly, I feel that since day one, it's all about the story. If the story is strong, people really aren't going to give a damn about the quality. I agree with you 100% on that. 100%. Well, you know, we're, 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 we're getting close to the end of the interview, but, you know, you, for all of you, you know, are you, are you surprised by, I mean, of course, you know, me having been with Horror Society, now with Morbidly Beautiful, all that, you know, you know, I'm covering the film and I'm, I'm hyping it as much as I can, you know, when you give me permission to, to say certain things, you know, are you, are the three of you surprised by the the buzz about the first film and now the buzz that's coming with the second film. She wants to go uh, first. <laughs> I will. I'm a lady. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, was, I mean, I was hoping it would do really well, and I figured with the title that it would do really well and everything. But yeah, like I was saying before, with the uh, person um, figuring out who I was, and then I got a lot of friend requests um, from like people in the Persian Gulf, too, who apparently did really well in some liberal countries like Dubai and Turkey, and I got, like, a lot of followers on, like, Twitter and stuff and friend requests and even marriage proposals. So, yeah, I think um, <laughs> from, like, wealthy, wealthy guys that, like, own hotels and stuff. So, yeah, it, it really uh, it was surprising. <laughs> so. Cheyenne, for you. Um, I mean, when Sean told me that standings on IMDb, I kind of just, like, shat myself on the spot. I was like, how the fuck did you do that? <laughs> um, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure you, you beat Spider-Man Homecoming, Sean. <laughs> yeah, for, for a little bit. Yeah, stuck at Marvel. Anyway, um... <laughs> what, are you what are you talking about? Don't Fuck in the Woods was way better than Spider-Man Homecoming. I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> No, I was, I was extremely surprised when the buzz the first one got, it, as much as I enjoyed it, you know, it's hard it, it, for indie films to really get a lot of notoriety, especially the ones coming out of Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, you know, it's hard for us to get a lot of buzz going, um, and then when this one did, I was like, well, fuck yeah, and then once he dropped that, hey, don't fuck in the woods, too, and everybody was like, fuck yeah, I was like, yeah, I kind of see that, actually, I understand that, yeah, I'm excited, too. You know, Sean, for you, you know, like I said, I've been following your career from basically the get the beginning. You know, I go back to, you know, Midsummer Nightmares with <clears throat> with you. You know, you, what what are your thoughts on all this? You know, it's I definitely feel like it's I feel like your film work was established before this, but I feel like Don't Fuck in the Woods really put your name on the map. And now that the second one's happening and so much hype is starting to come around, you know, has that changed your approach to filmmaking? I mean, you know, how, how has all of this success so far made you feel? I mean, it's crazy. I never thought, like, I mean, I'm not going to lie. One of the highlights was I, that film was premiered in New York City. <laughs> like, for me, that was like, oh, my God, what the hell? Um because I just live in some backwoods town in Ohio that's got a very tiny population. Um, but it is it is completely, to me, it, it is crazy uh, on the hype and the success that the film has had. Um, that, of course, I got to take that into consideration with making a sequel, but, or for any other film for that fact, because... I don't know, to an extent, people could see me as one type of filmmaker, and I'm, I'm, I don't feel that I'm one type of filmmaker. Like, I don't, I love the storyline of Don't Fuck in the Woods and Don't Fuck in the Woods too. but it's like, do I want to be known for just those two movies? Eh, yes and no. Sure, that makes sense. It, be labeled as the fucking artsy kid and hang out with the 
just the artsy people because I mean that's how I was I wasn't like that in high school like I hung out with jocks when they became assholes I started hanging out with other people no I get that and you know as, as another interesting dynamic I know when I talked to you right after watching the movie. You know, one of the dynam dynamics that isn't talked about a lot, too, is when, when you do a film that's as galvanizing as Don't Fuck in the Woods was, you know, <clears throat> how did your how did your family in particular respond to the success and the notoriety that you and the film got afterwards? <laughs> that's just kind of funny because during it, I went through a divorce. <laughs> Hey, buddy, I've been there and done that. I, I know all about that. Um, honestly, though, as far as my family goes, um, other than my kids, I'm sorry, I could really give a fuck. Um, they, they, they're either going to approve or disapprove. They'll continue to give me those sharp glances at family functions because they feel I'm a smut peddler or something. Um, <laughs> but, but I look at it this way. My kids... No, I have not shown my children the movie. I will say that for sure. <laughs> but but they see the creature suit and they see like I have pictures on my wall of like Scotty dressed up in the suit and like they're cute like pictures and I'm like posing under him like it's a family portrait. And and they see that and it's like they realize that that's Uncle Scotty. Like my kids wear the mask sometimes. So it's I don't know. They think it's cool, so I'm okay. No, I, I get that. I, I have a 16-year-old daughter who's going to be 17, and, you know, when she was four, you know, I did her up as a zombie in, in the first film I worked on, and, you know, I think it's it's cool because her school is getting ready to do a comedic version of Night of the Living Dead, and, <clears throat> you know, she's talked to her teacher about me coming in to help with the effects and all that so to you know to me it's always cool when when the kids or, or family members you know understand what it is that you do and know it, that it's your passion and and they love you for it regardless so i mean I, I get that especially with your kids man i really do right now brandy i know you had, i know you had kind of mentioned um <clears throat> you know like the fan mail response and and all of that and uh, you know, when your brother mentioned you on on the Facebook page and all that, but like, how was it with you and your family? Because I know you have a pretty extensive career as an actress as well. But you know, what were their thoughts on your role in Don't Fuck in the Woods? Um, I remember calling my grandparents' house one day to talk to them about something. I don't remember what it was for. It might have been a dinner or something that they were having, and I was talking to them. So I called, my grandmother answered the phone, and I'm, and I'm talking to her, and she goes, uh, what's this don't fuck in the woods thing? And I'm <laughs> like, what? Where'd you, I, I was like shocked, I was like, where'd you hear that from? She, she goes, Leslie, which is my uncle, um, he's only about 10 or 11 years older than me, because my mom's the, the oldest out of seven children, so, um, so my uncle, who's on Facebook, I'd seen it and told my grandmother about it, and my grandmother chuckled. I was just like, Grandma, it's a horror film that I'm in. She probably don't want to watch. And she goes, oh, it's okay. You're old enough to do what you want. And she just laughed about it. So, my family's pretty cool. Um, I know at first, in the beginning of my career, my family was a little bit weird about me doing nudity, but then when they saw that, you know, I'm actually, like, good at, like, acting and I'm getting bigger roles and stuff all the time, um, you know, they're supportive now and everything. They're not, like, going around bragging about it like they did because I'm a, a Navy veteran, you know. Um, they're not going around, obviously, bragging about it like that. that <laughs> but they, um, they're they happy for me. You know, they now they're instead of saying, well, why would you do that? Is, um, is this something that I can watch? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, if I talk to the director and have them do a cut where I'm blurred out... <laughs> <laughs> I'm like you probably still don't want to watch it though because I I make noises and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Cheyenne, for you, you know, of, co of course, now, you weren't with the first one, but of course, like I said, going into the second one and the, and the notoriety of the film and all the hype it's generating, you know, how how, do, how does your family feel? Um, well, that's a stunned silence. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Well, I have, uh, I have 
daddy issues. So my father is extremely religious and disapproves of anything I do that isn't religion based. Um, so he, he's horrendously disappointed, and and I, I get a lot of bad looks. Uh, I had a aunt that told me that I was going to hell on my birthday, which happened to be our Thanksgiving dinner. Oh man. Congratulations. There's nothing like that uh, when when your kid gets older and you can show them your your film library. It it really is a special moment, and I'm glad that you're going to be able to experience that in the future. And I'm um, I'm very happy that you have a, a you know a spouse who supports your work because that that's very important. I mean, I think as Sean and I can both testify, we know what it's like to to have someone who who doesn't necessarily support or or, you know, condone what it is that you do with your passion. So, like I said, I, I applaud you for having all that. You're you're very fortunate in that aspect. I mean, I know, I know we're trying to wrap up, but one last thing, uh, kind of one of the things about me and Sean working together was my wife had to put up with me being miserable on the wicked one because of just creative differences and things being changed and just things that didn't go the way that I thought that they probably should have, but it wasn't my film. Right. Um, the summer was kind of the same way, but I was taking on a mantle so much that I was miserable constantly, just like panicking and almost by myself in a sense of just not knowing what to do. Um, and so she looked at it and was like, I don't know if you really need to keep doing this. You're, put, you're damaging your body, your mind, your, you know, your soul almost. Um, but then when she had met, when she first met Sean, she fell in love with Sean, and Sherry considers Sean a, a close, sweet friend, um, and trusts him, and she trusts him to take care of me and to, to treat me right and fair. Um, so when she sees that him and me writing, and I come home with new scenes, even though they might have tons of sex and gore and horrendously foul language in it, she still smiles because she sees me smiling, and that, that's the, that's the only thing I could ever ask for. And, and, and like I said, man, I'm, I'm very happy that you have that in your life. That's an important part of what we do. Well, you know, like we had said, we're right here at the end. But before I let all of you go, with each one of you, uh, Brandy, let me start with you. You know, tell people where they can follow you, Facebook, Twitter, websites, and any other projects that you have coming up that you want to just get a quick shout out to. Um, yeah, they can follow me on Facebook. Um, Instagram and Twitter. I don't really post a whole lot on Instagram and Twitter. I just, I don't know. I always forget I have those accounts, but they can follow me on there. Um, I'm definitely on Facebook a lot. Um, let's see, upcoming projects. I'm working on a film for John Johnson called Rifters. And um, we'll be filming the rest of that in, sometime in March. Mm -hmm. And then um, 
I got approached by another filmmaker recently who, um, I don't know if I'm saying his name correctly, but he did the movie Cyborg with Jean-Claude Van Damme, Albert Pine. <laughs> yeah, I, I know who you're talking about. But he um, asked me um, to be involved in his next project called Badass Angel. So that'll be filming sometime next year. And that's all I can say about that right now because it's on Facebook and he's tagged me in a bunch of stuff. So it's obvious that I'm involved in it. Very nice. <laughs> So, as of right now, those are the only three off the top of my head that I know are actually happening. There's other stuff I've been approached by, but they don't know if, you know, if it's going to happen this coming up here or, you know, budgeting and all that. So, oh, and I just filmed with um, Brad Twig over the summer. I filmed some scenes um, for Wrestle Massacre, and uh, I got to work with a professional wrestler Renee Dupree. I got to play his girlfriend. and. Do uh, a scene with him. So that's very nice. I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a I'm a huge pro wrestling fan, so I know exactly who you're talking about. So yeah, yeah. But, yeah, this, this is the only project. Um, like I said, I can think of. Oh, seventh guest. I just finished seventh guest uh, last year too, um, based off the uh, interactive game that was with John Johnson. So yeah, those are the that should be coming out sometime soon. I think that's in the editing phase right now. And those are the only projects I can think of. Okay. Cheyenne, how about for you? People want to follow you, upcoming projects, things like that? Um, yeah, I'm a dinosaur. You can follow me on Facebook. That, that's about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as far as projects, so uh, I got a laundry list. Um, I, we just, uh, we're actually going to shoot or um, send Screen for Summer, the uh, launcher flick that I had, we had just finished this past summer. Um, we're going to try and throw it at any horror movie conventions we can coming up in the next uh, seven or eight months. Um, we've already been approached by a couple of distribution companies, um, but we wanted to take it through the circuit first to get some of those you know, real people to realize what it is um, before we start shopping for distribution. That's exciting. Um, uh, me and Sean obviously working on Don't Fuck in the Woods 2. Um, we're also working on a... Hey, uh, another monster movie that is very much a <laughs> he's very excited about it it's very much a uh, critters meet super troopers type thing oh yes uh, where, where Sean is going to be playing a, a police officer that screams the most horrendous profanities at old people um, <laughs> <laughs> um that one and then the only other one I can think of um is me and Sean are also going to be doing a movie called L, which I wrote. Um, but that's probably going to be another year or so before we start trying to film that. Um, that is my, that's kind of my swan song movie that everybody is badgering the shit out of me. Doesn't hurry up and make because everybody loves the script that I've shown. Um, way more psychological and serious and dramatic, um, which is a first for me. Um, but that's a, that's about it. Unless Sean wants to like include me in any of his future projects, like, you know, <clears throat> just saying, Sean. Well, Sean, of course. We're taking it a day at a time here. No. <laughs> Sean, of course, you know, for you, you know, we know we can follow you on Facebook, you know, Twitter, anything like that. Wet an actual website and projects outside of Don't Fuck in the Woods too. Um, I am on Instagram as well as Twitter, and I believe it's S M Burkett B U R K E T T. Um, you can also see all kinds of uh, films that Concept Media has made at conceptmediallc.com, as well as check out our casting page if anybody's interested in being in a film with gratuitous nudity. 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 <laughs> Hey, you know, that's, that's always a bonus. Well, you know, guys, I really want to thank you so much for being on. You know, I'm glad you, you know, you were able to give me some time to come on and talk about this project, your other projects. You guys know that you're always welcome here. Um, I look forward to having you guys on again as guests. If you ever need press releases or you have any news about any future horror projects, let me know. I'll get that stuff up on morbidlybeautiful.com for you guys at any time. No problem, guys, and uh, we hope to talk to you all soon. Uh, Good night.
And once again, we would like to say thank you to director and producer Sean Burkett, actress Brandy Mason, and actor-writer Cheyenne Gordon of the un- upcoming concept media films Don't Fuck in the Woods 2. If this film is going to be anything like the original, we're going to be in for one hell of a ride. Coming up in just a few moments, we're going to do our final digital dismemberment spotlight for the evening. We're going to be talking about Anchor Bay Entertainment's limited edition collector's tin release of Lucio Fulci's The Beyond. But before that, we're going to go into our final Metal Massacre spotlight for the evening. And in this one, we are highlighting the band Cradle of Filth. The CD is Dusk and Her Embrace, the original Sin, and the song is Dusk and Her Embrace.
and welcome back. You just heard Cradle of Filth. The CD was Dusk and Her Embrace, the original Sin, and the song was Dusk and Her Embrace. Now, Dusk and Her Embrace, the original Sin, is a re-release remixing of the 1996 Dusk and Her Embrace. It was released on July 8th of 2016 through Cacophonus Records. Make sure to head on over to www.cradleoffilth.com to get more details on the band, find out when they're touring, and to pick up their merchandise. But now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our final digital dismemberment. And in our final digital dismemberment spotlight for the evening, we are covering Anchor Bay Entertainment's limited edition collector's tin release of Lucio Fulci's The Beyond. Of course, the film was directed by Lucio Fulci, and the special effects were handled by none other than the awesome Gianetto Dorossi. Now, the premise of the film is, is, is a young woman inherits an old hotel in Louisiana where after a series of supernatural accidents, she learns that the building was built over one of the entrances to hell. Now, spoiler alert, because I'm going to be talking about several of the things that happen in this film. This is another one of those movies that if you don't own it, go stand in the corner while the real horror movie fans talk. This very well may be one of the greatest horror movies ever. Never mind if it is an Italian or an American film or anything else. Ever. Decent cast and acting move this movie along. However, it is the story, makeup, and camera work of Fulci that makes this gore classic work. And there's a little bit more background detail. An inherited hotel is basically sitting above one of the seven gates of hell. People start dying about one minute into this movie, and it just keeps going from there. People are being whipped with chains, crucified to walls, acid thrown on them, eyeballs being gouged and poked out, animals ripping the throats out of their owners, just about everything you could ask for is in here. Now, interestingly enough, especially for a Lucio Fulci film, there is no nudity in this film, which is kind of a surprise, but the movie really doesn't need it anyway. Some of the effects are really chilling to watch, including the ones that involve tarantulas that will freak you out. The music and set pieces are perfect. Some of the real true gems in the effects is a a chain whipping across the face, shoulder, leg, and waist. There's a crucifixion with nails through the wrists. Uh, Again, there's some acid to the face multiple times with melting flesh. There's a fall off of a scaffold. There's a hand to the face with an eyeball being popped out. You have the torn up face, um, vomiting chunks of, of some viscous fluid. There's a corpse that rises out out of the water. Um, There's some great autopsy scenes, including the stitching up of a corpse. Um, You know, you have tarantulas biting the face, lips, tongue, nose, and eyes out of a person. Uh, There's a really gruesome nail through the back of the head and popping an eyeball out sequence. And um, again, there's a scene with a dog where it just rips the throat and gnaws the ear off of its owner. It's pretty gruesome. And of course there's the zombies. Um, You have the zombie that is attacked by a dog. You have multiple gunshots, uh, both to the body and the head. Uh, You have a really strange and unique sequence where a shadowed window throws shards of glass into someone's face and an exploding gunshot blast to the head with a tremendous amount of blood and gore. If you even remotely like the sight of blood and gore, then this is the flick for you. In my opinion, this may be one of the greatest zombie genre films of all time. Lucio pulls out all the stops, and his eyes find the most interesting places to film. Not enough can be said about how well this film comes together. And 
you know, one of the other things that really gives the film a lot of gravitas is I, I always seem to talk about how locations can make or break a film. And in this film, uh, filmed uh, primarily in Louisiana, some of the set locations are just absolutely stunning. You would absolutely believe that what you are looking at is a haunted hotel that is placed on one of the seven gateways to hell. Uh, you know, just just a very gothic style. There are a few visual gags that are caught where the lead actor attempts to load bullets through the barrel of the gun and you can see the, the lead actress kind of smile as, as the door closes. There's a few spelling errors, things like that. <clears throat> but overall, I mean, a very grim film, <clears throat> but very beautiful in, in a very dark, dark way. Now, to me, <clears throat> before Scream Factory came along, Anchor Bay Entertainment was the company that put out the best releases when it came to special features and things like that. And this was part of a series of movies that they put out in limited edition collector's tins. And I'm not talking about steel books. I'm talking about actual collector's tins. And... It was, it was just absolutely stunning to behold. I almost wish that companies would do something like this again. I don't want to see it for all releases, but for certain special releases, this set was was definitely well worth the forty nine ninety nine price tag at that time. Um, as of now, I've seen these box sets going for at least $100 or more factory sealed. I know at one time, this particular film was pushing the almost the $200 level. Now, when we talk about special features and extras, I mean, there's a wealth of them in this box set, including the U.S. re-release trailer, and this is a beautifully remastered and letterbox trailer that was done by Rolling Thunder Pictures. It is an absolutely crystal clear picture and audio. There's an international theatrical trailer, which is letterboxed, very clean, great sound. It is a much more graphic trailer than the American version and runs almost three and a half minutes. There's also a German theatrical trailer. This one is letterboxed, but the picture is a grainier quality and the sound is not quite as sharp. Again, it is a more graphic tone than the American version and runs about 3 minutes 18 seconds. Now, there's a host of featurettes on this disc, including images from the beyond. This featurette runs 5 minutes and 25 seconds. They show almost a hundred assorted stills from the film in black and white and color. They also include poster art from various countries. The coolest edition is showing the various versions of the soundtrack with the various CD art. There's another small featurette called Filming the Beyond. It's about a minute and 26 seconds. This shows various production of behind the scenes stills in color and in black and white. Many that include pictures of Lucio. There are also assorted single pics of the actors and the film crew. There is a uh, Katarina McCall and David Warbeck interview. This is an old interview that took place three years after the film's release. Nothing really big is discussed here other than they are surprised about how big the film has, you know, had become. There is a small featurette called David Warbeck Superstar. This includes different photo stills from assorted films he had been in and from his personal life. There's also a small interview where he discusses the filming of The Beyond and he speaks very fondly of Lucio. States that he thinks that these types of films are important because they show the dark side in all of us. He also goes on to say that it is all in how we control it. There's the uh, Lucio Foltri, The Maestro featurette. This one starts off with different stills of his films. They also show segments of him filming Demonia. <coughs> There's a small interview here, but the quality is <clears throat> pretty poor. He talks about his health and various film projects. They show his boating trophies and various film awards that he, has won over, he had won over the years. What is really neat are some of the press clippings and magazines that he has uh, been in. At the end, they show a tribute to Fulci that reads Lucio Fulci, Godfather of Gore, 1927 to 1996. There's the Lucio Fulci and David Warbeck at Eurofest 94. This one runs about three minutes. They show various ads for the convention in this. 
There's a packed house um, asking questions of Lucio and David. They both make jokes and discuss their films, but you can really tell by this point that Lucio is sick. At the end, it says dedicated to, to the memory of David Warbeck and Lucio Fulci. Now, some of the other things uh, that are included is a German color pre-credit sequence. Now, this is the opening sequence of the film in color instead of the washed out brown and gray. It is letterboxed and looks magnificent. Now, this runs about 8 minutes and 20 seconds. It can be watched in either English or German. There is a Necrophagia music video for the song And You Will Live in Terror. There's lobby cards. Uh, there are seven lobby cards that come with it that show various poster art and production skills. And of course, I mentioned the limited edition 10, which was limited to 20,000 copies. The audio setup, uh, they have 5.1 English, Dolby Stereo English 2.0. They have the original mono soundtrack. Um, in English, the Italian mono soundtrack. There's English subtitles and commentary with the stars, David Warbeck and Katerina McCall. Now, as I mentioned before, the movie boasts tremendous sound quality. If you don't own a home theater system, this movie is made to make you go buy one. The commentary is very entertaining and covers a wide base of topics, such as Fulci's various filming techniques, how much fun Italian films are to make, their emotions during filming, Lucio's fits and temper, how some of the cast and crew spoke different languages, how real the special effects looked and the quality of the movie, and that there should be more movies made like this. And uh, everyone speaks very highly of Lucio throughout all of this. You should take the time to listen to this when you get a chance. You really find out a lot about the filming process and how masterful Lucio was. It's definitely top-notch quality. Now, there is a hidden trailer. If you enter the images from the Beyond screen and highlight the menu option, press left to highlight the Ibon symbol. Press enter to view a trailer from Cat in the Brain. There's also an original opening sequence. If you enter the audio setup screen and highlight the resume option, you press left to highlight the Ibon symbol. Uh, press enter to view the original opening sequence of the movie. Overall, this was just absolutely a great flick. It's absolutely a shame that Fulci is dead because I believe he could have shown some of these young Hollywood film directors a thing or two. <clears throat> you are sadly missed, Lucio. Now, you might be able to find this limited edition 10 on eBay or another online auction site. It's definitely going to cost you money, but trust me, it is worth it. Anything and everything you could want in a collectible is included in this set. Thanks must also be given to Quentin Tarantino for showing his love for this film and bringing it to the midnight showings so that a younger generation could discover it. Now, <clears throat> this was released in 2000. Uh, it's not rated. It's about 88 minutes long. And, uh, of course, it's color NTSC. Uh, Dolby Digital English 5.1. Dolby Stereo English 2.0. Original mono, both in English and Italian. Um, aspect ratio is 2, 3, 5, 1. Uh, I would absolutely give this movie a 5 out of 5. The DVD gets a 10 out of 10. Again, they just, they don't, they don't make them like this anymore. And it's absolutely a shame. Make sure, if you can, head on to a, an auction site and see if you cannot find yourself a copy of Anchor Bay's limited edition Collector's 10 of Lucio Fulci's The Beyond. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we had an absolutely fantastic show this evening. I know we ran a little long tonight, but it's not often we get to interview someone of the caliber of Sean Burkett, Brandy Mason, and Cheyenne Gordon. I'm looking forward to Don't Fuck in the Woods too. You should as well if you are a fan of innovative horror. I want to say thank you to our friends at Scream Factory for sending us our Blu-ray edition copy of Squirm. And thank you to Anchor Bay Entertainment for releasing the limited edition collector's 10 of Lucio Fulci's The Beyond. I also want to say thank you to the fantastic bands we got to listen to this evening, including a Flesh Grinder, uh, Gorgoroth, and of course, one of my all-time favorites, Cradle of Filth. Make sure to turn in next week as the dead man tells you all to rest in peace.
Peace.